And the key questions we are asked to consider is what accounts for the fact that in so many uh, uh, countries democratic processes and mechanisms are readily subverted to serve the interests of powerful elites? Um, and what is the relationship between democracy and neoliberal economics? Okay. Mm. So those are the questions that we are supposed to focus on this time. Now, in, in this introduction, I would like to move from very brief, some brief comments on the, on the past, on the historical philosophical foundations, then move on to the present crisis, and then the future. So it's a kind of a temporal trajectory. <coughs> The only reason I want to talk about the past at all is because um, it's important to be clear about terminology. And if we say liberal democracy, or for that matter illiberal, what do we actually mean? And uh, I think it's very important that, as I said in an earlier con uh, comment, there are democratic traditions all over the world. Um, in a way, humanity lived in a fairly democratic fashion uh, for most of its, now what, what is the current theory? About 300,000 years of Homo sapiens. 99% of that time, we lived in democratic, small hunter-gatherer societies. We moved into more complex systems. We, we had to develop different mechanisms uh, to maintain a just society, which is something we naturally uh, wish for. We all are upset if we see our injustice. It's kind of an inbuilt uh, thing. But liberal democracy is a particular tradition. Uh, it's sometimes called Western democracy, but not, e not even that is true. It's not representative of all kinds of Western democracy. Even. It's really very much uh, related to the, uh, the philosophical, tr uh, the, the Anglo Saxon philosophical. Uh, tradition and closely tied to economic liberalism. And there's a whole lot of confusions that arise from that because the, the, uh, the question really is then, does a democracy need to be liberal? I've got a number of questions. I don't expect you to answer them all, but this is just as a, as a thinking point. So what is the link between liberalism and democracy, we have the, you know, from the French Revolution, liberté, égalité, fraternité. Uh, but the liberté in the French Revolution is somewhat different from liberalism as it is understood in that context. And that is worth thinking about. And it's worth asking whether liberté or, or liberalism, let alone liberalism, can stand on its own. It's got to be seen in that tension between you know, solidarity, fraternity, um, treating uh, each other as, uh, as brothers and sisters, in other words, and, um, and of course, egalité, yeah, that, that there's a certain, certain amount of equality that has to be also uh, guaranteed. Now, the way that's usually solved is that you have in, in, a, in, a, in practical terms, democracy, as we understand it, is majority rule. It's not the rule of all, it's majority rule, but with provisions to protect minorities and individuals. So certain provisions, usually constitutional provisions, mm -hmm. bills of rights, not every country has them. For example, Australia doesn't have a bill of rights, unfortunately. Um, okay, so that's just to kind of get some perspective on what illiberal <coughs> means. Because if you look now at the present situation, it, it's, it's very important that we ask ourselves, is liberalism actually lacking or is it in excess? Um, because if you have a minority that is able to use the liberties of a democratic system, in order to empower itself to such an extent economically and ultimately then also politically that it actually dominates the majority, <coughs> is that not too much liberalism? Is it rather than illiberal, is it ultra liberal or, or excessively liberal Criminal. with regards to the, license. the liberties it's of the word is license. license, yeah. Well yeah. that's right. 
So in other words, uh, there's a limit to which you can increase liberty of the individual uh, before it becomes then you know, imp uh, an impingement on other people's uh, liberties. All right, now the Khan crisis, basically what we're seeing is that there are a number of governments now that have a particular kind of profile. They pursue a militarized foreign policy, protectionist trade policies, a new kind of strange economic nationalism, restrictive immigration policies, um, and also, I mean, many of these are emboldened by the rise of the Trump regime in the US. So those who were hiding in the closet feel it's kind of safe now to come out and be illiberal. It's kind of, it's been made acceptable by that. <coughs> Now, this goes hand in hand with a demolishing, it is a demolishing and polemic discrediting of democratic norms and institutions. That's another key characteristic. For example, the media, the lying media, uh, the, uh, the, the universities, the experts, you know, the, 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 the whole uh, polemic against experts, the discrediting uh, of bureaucracies as and, and, and the undermining of bureaucracies as independent institutions, as the state, simply as a state, and unpoliticized, all that has been repoliticized. I see it even in places like Australia, which you normally get scores high on democracy values, but every time there's a new government now, it's become the culture to replace the chief of police, you know, justices, uh, top bureaucrats, and stack all those positions with uh, loyalists rather than having a neutral public. So this is very serious. Um, the same with the undermining of other uh, public interest institutions such as the EPA, uh, putting you know an oil uh, industry executive in charge of the EPA in, in, in the US, that, that, those kinds of moves. And also there's a sort of push towards securitization at home. It's not just a militant stance towards uh, uh, other countries, but there's also a securitization at home, sometimes using terrorism or, or the idea of an ethnicized enemy within as the excuse. There's also militarization of the police, and all that is, is very kind of scary because uh, with all the surveillance, that's happening, the increasing incarceration rates in, in many of these countries. Uh, there is there's scope there for, for, for further, uh, further developments towards a fully-fledged fully police state in, in some of these countries. And we have authoritarian figures who style themselves um, as the only true spokespeople of the of spokesmen, usually men, of the people. So uh, and they do they they feel therefore they can do away with democratic procedures. Then they also use intimidation, public humiliation, uh, as as methods. Um, they they use fake news. They have a very abusive way of speaking to political opponents rather than a respectful, respectful uh, tone. And they don't like uh, bipartisan uh, sort of decision making in the common interest, which you know, really in reality politics should really be bipartisan. And if you have a two party system, it should be bipartisan on most issues. <coughs> um, Okay, so there's a number of uh, questions that one could consider there. Uh, one is that this step towards authoritarianism, I, I often wonder, is it not a step also towards a failed state? Uh, isn't it a sign <coughs> of systemic weakness? Because authoritarian, sta authoritarian states often give the appearance of strength, but I wonder, is there not a weakness in that and a collapse? And are there sort of systemic um, effects that lead to this, this process? Uh, is, it really that the isn't, is it not really that the political and economic establishment 
is failing to address the real issues, such as how to feed uh, another 50% more humans in 30 years' time, or so. You know, how to deal with how to deal with global warming, the fact that it could could reduce uh, uh, food production by 50%, uh, things like that. Sorry, I'm, I'm I work on on food security, so that's why those things come to my mind. Okay, but now let's think a little bit further to the future and think of Omir's comments earlier. Now, according to forecasts of uh, global consulting institutions, the, the disruptive changes in technology through ICT, artificial intelligence, robotics, automation, and so on, if not properly managed, will have severe social and economic impacts. We also have an aging population, many of them with increasingly low, low incomes because of the collapse of pension systems. We have a, a reduced a supply for growth in terms of labor and also demand. Um, on the one hand, so we have these powerful technologies that increase the efficiency of supplying goods dramatically, uh, but rising inequality, therefore, a demand problem, a lack of demand growth. Even the World Economic Forum has recognized that as a fundamental problem, a sort of systemic problem whereby capital accumulation beyond a certain point destroys its own foundations. Mm -hmm. And if, if it's going to work at all, governments will be forced to intervene more actively in the marketplace to address economic imbalances, because it's simply not workable. It's socially unsustainable, and of course also ecologically unsustainable, because it's all based on profit motive. Um, middle income families are likely to be disappear. There are predictions now that there'll be uh, <coughs> the haves and the have-nots will kind of be split roughly 20 to 80 percent. Seen that in, in several, from several sources now, these kinds of predictions. Okay, so that leads to another set of questions. Um, namely, how does the system have to change so that it can actually respond to the survival issues, the great transformation that is needed? How can that be? How can the system actually be changed so that it it gains the capacity to address those challenges. Is there a need or is there room for hybrid, new hybrid solutions? That means not uh, democracy as we knew it, but a new, new interpretations, new forms of democracy, new forms of building a just society. Um, and the question is, in the, within that system, who is responsible for protecting the economic interests and rights of, of, of minorities? Um, who is responsible for innovation, for change? Where is that conversation supposed to take place? Um, what is the place of you know, nationalism and authoritarianism? Why is it popular? What's the appeal? What are the issues that need to be resolved? to remove the attractiveness of those siren songs. So, many questions, but I thought since we are going to move over, uh, move, uh, move on to, sorry, to uh, a small group discussions next, I think the really important questions for this group is what are our priorities and our strategies? Uh, what can we do? So, the questions that I'd really like us to focus on, what are the responsibilities of the arts and sciences? What are our special advantages? Where can we make our contribution? Um, what disciplines are needed and how can we integrate them? Um, and what are the priority areas that we need to focus on? Because we can easily lose ourselves because there's so many different aspects to this problem, but where do we focus? Um, and of course, 
the, the rational thing is to focus on areas where we, we have the capacity to make a difference. But yes, we need to set goals for ourselves. And in terms of uh, strategies, what steps do we need to realize our aims? How can we formulate them? Um, what is our next step? Could we, would it be sensible to have a public statement or press release, uh, even a manifesto or something that is concise and to the point that could be uh, maybe sent to decision makers? What can we do uh, in order to expose uh, illiberal uh, uh, polemics in the public space? Is that something we can do or not? And finally, um, what kind of vision or agenda can we propose? Yeah, and, and of course, there are different, how, how do we go about uh, um, uniting those different competing visions and ideas that we have? What's our own process um, to, to get to that point where we can present something to the outside world, perhaps. <laughs>